So welcome, welcome all. It's good to see you here. We are in the phase of the semester when we have lots and lots of activities. As you know, I wanna draw your attention to two that are coming up next week. We have this, uh, Phil Richardson, who's the Assistant Director for National Intelligence for Mission Impact and Analysis and Collection. He's coming on Tuesday the 15th. And then on Wednesday the 16th, Gene Lee, who's gonna be giving us a look inside the North Korean uh, Kim's regime. Uh, which would be interesting. Maybe we'll get to that conversation with you as well. And then two weeks after that, put on your long range plan, planning character uh, calendar, February 28th, Mike Sraga, who's gonna be talking about uh, the Arctic and its importance in national security, a topic that's very important that we've never covered. So that will be of great interest. And then on March 1st, someone you know well, Ambassador Mike McFall, Michael McFall will be our uh, Phillips family lecture in the spring, and he uh, was former ambassador to Russia. Russia. He's a thorn in Putin's flesh. And trustee of Freedom House. Oh, he's well, a former trustee of Freedom House. Uh, but he uh, he's one of the most important voices on the current Russia crisis, and so we're very fortunate to have him. As we are fortunate to have uh, my old friend Michael Abramowitz here, and I'm glad that he's here. He's had an extraordinarily distinguished career uh, just to reflect some of them. Uh, Mike, you were at the Washington Post. That was before Bezos bought it. So the, the Post was struggling then, but then you moved on to the National Holocaust Museum uh, where you oversaid, saw genocide prevention efforts. Uh, but that was a time when there was mass atrocities spiraling around the world. Is that right? Yes. I don't recall. And then, and then you have moved to take over Freedom House, uh, and actually Freedom has declined globally. So my first question to you is, is there any chance I could get you to be the athletic director at UNC as your next assignment? Well, first of all, Peter, thank you very much for having me. Uh, it's really nice to see you. And I want to thank you in public for the first time for all the great leaks you gave me. No, 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 no. <laughs> <laughs> that actually is not true, just for the I, record, I, but he was, <laughs> Mr. Hadley, if you're listening, he was very loyal. <laughs> but uh, yes, I, 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 I gravitate to, uh, to trouble and have so far been unsuccessful in eradicating insoluble problems, but I, but I try. Well, uh, that's what we're going to talk about tonight. And so help us to understand the mission of Freedom House. Uh, and also your strategy for achieving that mission. So what is what is the purpose of Freedom House and how do you go about meeting it? Well, thank you for that question. So if I can give you a little bit of history, because I think the history is interesting. We were founded 80 years ago uh, by a group of individuals uh, uh, that, that cut across the political spectrum and included people like Eleanor Roosevelt and also Wendell Wilkie who had run against Eleanor's husband for the presidency in 1940. We were founded in 1941. And uh, I just mentioned that because in a time of great polarization, the commitment to try to work across the political aisle is kind of ingrained in our DNA in Freedom House. And it's obviously been more difficult in recent years. We can talk about that, but I think that's something we've always tried. But Freedom House was essentially founded to be a uh, to, to really get America into the war against fascism. That was the founding purpose. If you recall in the late 30s and early 40s, more than nine in 10 Americans did not want the United States to be involved in the fight against Hitler, even as he was conquering all of Europe. And Freedom House was founded to before Pearl Harbor to advocate for US entry into World War II. And uh, over the years, we've, we've evolved. Uh, and our probably our best known thing we do is we can talk more about this. We're about to publish our, I think our 50th or maybe 49th uh, version of Freedom in the World, which is our annual survey of of uh, of freedom in the world. But we really, I, I say, we boil us down to three things: we inform, we inform the public and other audiences about threats to democracy. Number two. We mobilize, we try to mobilize government officials and other thought leaders to protect democracy. And we protect, we, we work very closely on the ground all over the world 
with human rights defenders and journalists and other freedom loving people to, to secure their freedom. And that's in a nutshell what Freedom does, what Freedom House does. And you mentioned the, the index, it comes out every year. That's, that's the one that takes a temperature of the, the health of freedom globally, is that it? And so just talk a little bit about how you build that and what, what it does. Correct. This, this it's, it's essentially, I like to say the Michelin guide for countries with respect to freedom. We're, we're, we're rating countries uh, with, uh, to the extent to which they respect political rights and civil liberties. We've been doing this since 1973. And if you think back to the early 70s, freedom was actually kind of on its back heels. You had the Soviet bloc, you had China, which was closed, you had, uh, and communistic, you had, uh, Latin American military dictatorships. And the, my predecessors at the Freedom House wanted an annual survey to kind of focus attention on the, you know, on the troubles facing freedom around the world. And uh, we've done that for 50 years. It's widely respected. We look at every country in the world, including the United States, and we rate the level of political rights and civil liberties in each country. And that report has come to be kind of a proxy uh, for kind of the health of democracy. And the big picture is that after a long run of improvements, over the last 15 years, we are in what might be called a democracy recession, where every year for the last 15 years, and I don't really honestly sneak preview, expect that to change in, in two weeks, that every year there are more countries who are experiencing declines in political rights and civil liberties and those that have an improvement. So uh, our job is to try to turn that around. We, we group countries into three categories, free, green countries, uh, not free, purple countries, and yellow countries, partly free. And I would say our mission fundamentally is to work with others to help turn the map green, but that's Sadly, probably not going to happen in our lifetimes. So uh, I want to pull two threads there. One is the you're both uh, the umpire who is sort of scoring things, but then you're the umpire who's pushing it in a, in a direction, uh, in a certain direction. Uh, it would be like if U.S. News or World Report was also trying to move some of the, the, the schools in one direction or another. Do, do you ever find conflicts of interest across that? Or do you find that if you give a country a, a bad score, they kick your people out? Or? It's a good question, Peter. And, and the honest truth, it's a little bit of a balancing act. We are, I often say to our stakeholders, we're kind of a do tank. We kind of analyze the problems and we also try to do things about it. And there's kind of two different parts of Freedom House. Uh, we have a research team that is highly independent uh, very steeped in the methodology of the index, and they do a great job every year of doing the best job they can to assess the state of freedom in every country. And then we have the advocacy team and also the people on the ground who are trying to help, help people in these countries achieve freedom. Now, I don't think there is at heart a conflict, but there can be you know, in certain countries where we want to protect our people. And uh, if you, you know, there, there can be a conflict potentially between speaking out and, and protecting your people. Now, as you know, the State Department produces similar kinds of indexes, and it's a very big political process of who gets on what uh, and what their, their score is, and even countries lobby uh, to change the score. Do, are you experiencing a similar political process when you're building the, the index? Well, I would say... The process of building the index is very much insulated from politics. I actually do not involve myself in the setting of scores. I leave that to the research director working with the, uh, working with the team. And obviously I wanna make sure that the methodology is well observed and that the process is fair, but it's their, their judgments are, are independent. Uh, I, in my five years at Freedom House, I've not seen any kind of tampering of that, you know, independence in, in, in my experience. I will say that countries do pay attention 
to the results. The first week I was at Freedom House, I had a call from the Ukraine, kind of interesting given the fact that Ukraine is so much in the news today, but I had a call from the embassy, the foreign minister was in town and wanted to meet with me. And he was concerned about some element of our score. And I had to sort of assure him that, uh, you know, we, you know, we do this independently, there's no, but, but I get calls like that all the time, people, you know, complaining about this or that, but because people do pay attention very much to the scores, particularly because, you know, government agencies and uh, different international bodies do look at the scores and sort of making some decisions. So for instance, the Millennium Challenge Corporation, uh, which was set up under President Bush, uh, has, you know, looks at our governance scores as one criteria that they look at in evaluating whether or not to give uh, a grant to a particular country. So it, it can make a difference. And help us understand what uh, the scores might look like. So you said there's a green, a yellow, and a purple. Pick a obvious example in each of those categories, and then maybe uh, one that might be less obvious to us. Right. I'm guessing North Korea is purple. Definitely. Okay. Uh, the, the, is there the, a surprising purple that we might not think of as? No, the, the, the scores aren't really su surprising. Uh, the countries that are the worst in the world, I think this past year were Syria, Eritrea, North Korea. I forgot who was like the bottom, but they're like, we, 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 we look at 24 different indicators and through, and we evaluate countries and then that gets translated into a score of zero to 100. So those countries uh, that I mentioned, like have one or two. Syria and North Korea kind of vie for being the worst in the world for being the, uh, in terms of respect for civil liberties and political rights. Uh, the countries that tend to do well in our scores are Scandinavian countries, Sweden, uh, Denmark, uh, uh, Norway uh, have, have done well in our scores. Um, uh, we can come back to the US, but you know, we generally have done well in our scores. The middling countries, I think one good example to, that's top of mind for me would be India. India is, India is yellow. India is now yellow. It was, what, it was the big news last year because India has been green for a long time. Uh, it's you know the world's largest democracy, but under Modi, it's taken a very sharp nationalist turn. There's been persecution of Muslims. There's been a number of other reasons that we've downgraded India. And India crossed from being free to partly free last year. It was big news in India, and and uh, we uh, and because of that move, uh, let me just see if I get this figure right. We have now. Less than 40% of the world's population live in a free country. That's, that's a disturbing trend. And is it the sensitive enough that if a, the, the elections that are happening right now uh, in India, at least at the, the, the sub-state level, would they change the results? If, if the results of the election come in differently, you could change their score? Or is, is it baked? Are the things that are moving it less uh, volatile than that. Now, the things that are moving it, we look at 24 different areas. So some are political rights, some are civil liberties, but we look at things like, first of all, was the election free and fair? And there are different scores for that. And then we look at was, uh, is there a free press? Is there freedom of religion? Is there, uh, uh, you know, are there safeguards against corruption? So a range of different indicators that's on our website www.freedomhouse.org, and uh, and we met, and you know we there's a process by which we review every country's performance in those areas, including the United States. I just I wanted to say that one reason why I think our report does have credibility, and by the way, I think the the, the State Department's Human Rights Report is very good, but they don't look at the United States, and I think I often will say, well, you're just you know like in the, in the, in in the event of India, we had a fair amount of criticism. Uh, I said, well, you guys are just imperialists. You know, you're just mm -hmm. casting. I said, no, no, we, we look at our own country too. Mm -hmm. So that's- I, I'm going to dig into the US case in a moment. Sure. But first, I want to 
I, I want to see the kinds of things that, you, that you're tracking. So does it count? We're all required to wear masks. That's an infringement on our freedom. Right. Uh, and it's one that many Americans and, and Canadians, for that matter, feel very strongly about, right? So is, would that lower our score on the Freedom Index? And that, that may be a silly example. Can you talk a little bit about how the pandemic affected it more generally? Well, I will say in general, the pandemic has been not a good development for civil liberties in general around the world. I think, you know, our understanding of freedom is that, you know, it's not absolute. There are, there are limitations and in general terms, you know, one may be justified to take a public health measure that might incur freedom uh, in, you know, in the name of saving lives. So I think we recognize that. I think the issue with the pandemic is that a number of countries, and in fact, there's a, I think there's a front page story in the Times today or yesterday about this, about how measures that were instituted to be sort of part-time or temporary, if, if you will, uh, measures to further the public health have the danger of being uh, you know, institutionalized. So I think, for instance, one of the things that got a lot of attention last year was when you know, the Hungarian prime minister, you know, sees kind of emergency powers uh, that allowed him to make decisions, you know, without consultation with the legislature. And there was a lot of concern about that. So that's the issue. We, in the short term, there could be justifiable things done, but are they really necessary for the long term? So you said that for the last 15 years, there's been a, a, this gradual global retreat in freedom. A lot of scholars, critics, attribute that to the unhappy uh, developments in the Iraq war, that, that there was, prior to the Iraq war, color revolutions, and when the Iraq war looked like it might be producing a positive result, you saw a flowering globally. And then as the Iraq war mires in problem, so too does the, the march of freedom. Is that... Does, is that consistent with what, how Freedom House interprets? I think that's a little bit, I think that might be a little bit simplistic. I think there are, I, 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 let me put it this way. I'm not saying you're being simplistic, but I'm just saying I think that point of view might be. I, I think that there is no question that the Iraq war was a setback in terms of especially the United States' ability to support and promote democracy overseas, which has always been, I think, to some extent, part of our foreign policy uh, since, since World War II. The, uh, but that's different than what are like the underlying trends that are causing this diminution of, 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 of retreat of democracy, if you will. So I, I think of three or four, and there are probably many more, there have been literally hundreds of books that have been written in the last four or five years on this subject. But I do think that economic challenges, the, the dislocations caused by the, uh, the financial crisis of 2008, 2009, had a long tail. And I think uh, many democracies, you know, really failed to deal with that effectively. And I think that that caused a lot of discontent in many countries with really the, the delivery of democracy uh, uh, or the delivery of results by democracies. I think also, you know, one thing I think about Russia and China have really changed a lot in the last 30, 35 years. I think, you know, I, I, as Peter said, I was a reporter for the first part of my professional career. And, you know, really in the early part of my professional career, uh, you, know, you had the fall of the Berlin Wall in 1989. And I think both Russia and China seem to be on a, maybe not a democratic path, but a liberalizing path. And that has totally changed, you know, certainly since Vladimir Putin took over and then since Xi Jinping, who have taken their countries in a much more repressive uh, direction. And, and by the way, I think that's significant for the world because they have, these countries are not just repressing their own people, but they are 
increasingly willing to interfere in other countries. Quick two-hander, and then you can give Please. me your third one. What is, uh, where do Russia and China score on your index? Are they mostly free or? No, 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 they're, they're not free. Both countries are not okay. free. And, and China is an interesting story because China. So they're purple. They're, they're both countries are purple and China, China has from a very low base has gotten, you know, even less free in the last 10 years under President Xi. Is it as low as it was in 73? Surely it couldn't be as low. It's probably up some, but, but I, think, I think the numbers went from 17 on a scale of 100 to 10 uh -huh. in the last uh, 10 years. And under, I, Xi Jinping. under Xi Jinping. I mean, and you think about basically snuffing out freedom in Hong Kong, mm. you know, the, the, the genocide against the Uyghurs in Xinjiang, uh, and then just in general, the great Chinese firewall, the incredible surveillance uh, state that has been set up. Uh, and, 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 and China is showing much greater self-confidence on the international stage. I mean, you know, when Peter, when you and I were, when I was covering the White House, I, I, I think about this in 2008 and President Bush, you know, made the decision to go to the Olympics. And I think it probably was a justified decision at the time. But you know, today there was no way that any U.S. president right. could do that. So the, the only the, what the, was the third one? You you said there was a third cat. Uh, well, there are, a, there are a couple. Let me mention one other thing that I think a lot about as a former journalist is that I think the media ecosystem has turned very sour towards democracy. And by that I meant in two. It, it, we thought that the internet would be a liberating technology, right? And we were, we were taken in by what happened in Tahir Square and the ability of Facebook to mobilize the protesters to overthrow the uh, regime. And you know, we do another report that's very important, our Freedom of the Net report, which shows also increasing violation of online rights around the world. And I think what's happened is the bad guys have figured out how to use the internet to, to, to undermine freedom. So one of the, the trends that you alluded to with India, but it's not just India, uh, are either formal allies or close partners of the United States who were thought to be on side or you know, in the flotilla moving in the right direction have fallen back. Modi, you mentioned, but he's not the only one. No, I think uh, we, we talked about this, I think, at the uh, conference you and I were at a few months ago. I think that's a really interesting and thought provoking trend, which I don't really think we've kind of internalized, you know, as a country yet. Some of the countries that have done really poorly in our scores over the past uh, 10 years, not just India, Turkey, mm -hmm. Uh, NATO ally. Yeah, Poland. NATO ally. Hungary. NATO ally. Uh, the Philippines. Close yeah, ally. Close ally. And, uh, and so it's not just, you know, we're not just worried about our, our, our rivals anymore in terms right. of but so we're, but our friends. Why, why is there this backsliding, I guess, is what you would call it. Why is there this retrograde movement amongst our friends? Is it idiosyncratic in each country? So do, is it well, the it is, story, it, it, the Orban story? I think it is, I think it is idiosyncratic in each country and there's no like one size fits all explanation for this. But I think that there is a growing feeling in many countries that the only thing you need to do is have elections. And by the way, elections are really important. They're foundational to democracy. Having a free and fair election, you know, is a sine qua non, but you can't just have a free and fair election if you don't have a free press, if you don't have an independent judiciary to be a check on the executive, if you don't have a, uh, if you don't have freedom of speech, uh, if you throw your political opponents in jail, or if you drive your, uh, if, if, or if you drive your, uh, you know, critical newspapers into, into economic ruin, that will also degrade the quality of democracy. I think that's one of the most important things that we try to explain at Freedom House, that democracy is, is about elections, but about much more. 
So I, I think that these, I think what's happened in some, in, in many, I, th I think the story of the last 15 years is a story of rising authoritarianism, but also weakening democratic performance in traditional democracies. Is there one of those in our backsliding friends that worries you the most? Or, and, or is there one that you are least worried about because you think that it, it will be resolve itself or it's on the mend? Well, I try to be hopeful. I mean, I, I think that, I, I think the one that I think about a lot is Venezuela. You know, 30 years ago, Venezuela was one of the jewels of our hemisphere. You know, very strong democracy, very strong uh, economy, and really under Chavez and then under Maduro, you know, democratic rights have been eroded to the point really where it's not so much a, a democracy problem anymore, but it's a, just a state collapse problem. And I think Venezuela is a cautionary story. Uh, uh, you know, I'm ho I mean, these things do move in waves. You know, your teacher, Samuel Huntington, talked about how democracy would be, you know, building up for a while and then it would crash. And, you know, we had the third wave, which lasted, I guess, from after World War II to about 50 or 60, yeah, and in which really there's massive, you know, democratization really around the world. And now we're cresting or now we're coming down and I hope, and I hope that we can, I mean, our goal is, all of our goals should be to ignite the fourth wave. So um, is, I'm still gonna to get to the United States eventually. So, but I- is, You don't have to ask me about that. No, I do wanna ask you about that because I think that's, that's very interesting. Uh, but first, is there, are there any good news stories? I mean, you're gonna release it in two weeks. Can you give us a teaser about any hopeful note? Is there any country that's going to make us feel good about well, let me just say, let me just say in general, I try to be a hopeful person, mm -hmm. and I do think uh, that I start the story of hope by saying that I do think the natural feeling of the human heart, as John McCain once said, is for freedom. And I was struck over the last several years in many countries around the world where it had been perceived that freedom had been extinguished. So places like Hong Kong or Belarus or Sudan or Myanmar, hundreds of thousands, even millions of people, you know, coming out to the streets to demand their rights. And yes, in many of these cases, there was a counter reaction from the authoritarians. But to me, that was a very powerful sign that if people have their choice, that they want political rights and civil liberties. The other thing I would say is that there are many countries around the world that are in much better shape and that we would not have imagined. Uh, so I grew up, you know, as my, my dad was in the State Department and you know, his focus was on Asia right. in, the, uh, in the 70s and 80s. And in the 70s and 80s, South Korea was a military dictatorship. Taiwan was a military dictatorship essentially. And these countries are now flourishing democracies. I, mean, I guess you can have an argument about whether Taiwan's a country or not, but it's a but it's a it's a, it's a flourishing democracy and does very well in our scores. Mm -hmm. So I think those kinds of things give me hope. So I want to ask you about another country that has been in the news uh, from some of your sister organizations. So Amnesty International, uh, Human Rights Watch. These are some of the other well-established international NGOs who focus on human rights. And they've called out Israel for uh, backsliding on human rights and, and for being basically an apartheid state, I believe is how Amnesty International called it. Did, uh, did, you, did they invite you to sign that? And did you guys consider signing it? What, how, how does Freedom House view the Israeli freedom score? Well, first of all, we do our own analysis of every country. So what we have to say, so when Freedom of the World comes out in two weeks, there'll be an overall essay, so to summarize in the state of the world, 
highlighting the major trends. And then there'll be a very detailed country report on each, uh, on each country uh, in the world, uh, including Israel. And one thing that's a little bit tricky with all countries, and this is actually what the Ukrainian foreign minister was mad at me about, is that in the case of Ukraine, we, we look at not necessarily the countries, but if there's like, if there's a different form of government in Crimea, because the, the, the Russians have seized it, then we analyze that separately from Ukraine. We're not saying that Russia is entitled to that, but our-, so our Crimea our, doesn't count against Ukraine's score, but correct. it also therefore doesn't count as part of Ukraine. Right, it doesn't count against Ukraine's score. But the theory is that we're, we're looking at the level of, of freedom experienced by people in each of these countries. So there's a so so the same thing goes for you know there's different levels of situations from Israel proper, the you know the, the, the West Bank and Gaza and so forth. So just in general, I would say one can be critical of Israeli human rights violations, and I think we're very concerned about that. I think I've not read the Amnesty report, it just came out. But in general, I don't think the word apartheid is a good description and not actually a helpful description to kind of advance things. So, so it's possible that Israel still scores relatively high because places like Gaza don't count against their score. Is that right? right? And, right. And, what, and same would be for the Palestinian Authority controlled. Correct. Correct. Bank. Correct. Okay. So that... That does that does tweak them in a way that you know biases them in favor of the Israeli scoring high, right? If because of course Amnesty International is counting those against Israel. Yes, that's a fair point. So, uh, but by the way, we are we don't just take that approach for the t those territories. We take it for any. T that's our general policy on how we approach. Taiwan doesn't help China. <laughs> No, we, we, Taiwan, Taiwan counts for Taiwan. Taiwan not. counts for Taiwan, not for China. Right. Crimea is separate from, from the rest of Ukraine. Yes. Does Texas count for the U.S. or is that a separate? Uh, I, I, is the U.S. helping or hurting the march of freedom around the world? Not, not U.S. domestically, but U.S. foreign policy. I'm, gonna, I'm moving my way now towards U.S. domestic, but... Obviously, this has been a priority of the Clinton administration. Enlargement was a big part of their story. President Bush freedom agenda made a big part of his story. Uh, and several, and even Obama talked about uh, human rights a lot. I has made it a, a focal point. So is US helping or hurting? It's a mixed picture. I think that to me, the United States is an exceptional country. Doesn't mean that we don't make mistakes. Uh, and you know, in our lifetime, Peter, there've been very serious mistakes, obviously, that, uh, that do not, and probably the greatest stain on US democracy was slavery and then Jim Crow and, and, and you know, ongoing racial discrimination. So I, I, I think that, you know, we have to approach this humbly, but there's no other country in the world that, you know, can stand up for freedom the way we do. And I think if you look at the impact of U.S. presidents over the years, whether it's Jimmy Carter in setting up the Human Rights Bureau, or President Reagan in confronting the, uh, quote, evil empire, uh, I, think, uh, I think in general, the U.S., you know, has been a force for good. But in the last 15 years, in this slide, I'm talking about, how, can, how much of that can you attribute to U.S. missteps or blind, blind eyes? So there's the debate about Egypt. Have we put enough pressure on Egypt? Well, we don't think we put enough pressure on Egypt. Yeah. But I would just say that I think sometimes we look at this in a very U.S.-centric way. The, the trends we're talking about are global trends. You know, what's happening in Russia, you know, is being driven by Vladimir Putin, or what's happening in China is being driven by Xi Jinping. You know, to say that the US, because of Iraq, is causing that, to me, seems not 
wise. And and what about, I'm just thinking now of these dilemmas as they present themselves in US foreign policy, Saudi Arabia and MBS, okay? On the one hand, surely his reforms were helping the score. Right. On the other hand, killing Khashoggi. Uh, that was a problem, <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> I think one of the realities, and Peter, you, you're an expert on this, about U.S. foreign policy, it's, it's a consistent battle between uh, you know, our interests and our values. I happen to think that our interests do coincide with our values. If we were only a country that were only interested in our interests, I think that'd be a problem for our foreign policy. Uh, and I think every president in my lifetime has had to wrestle with this. Uh, you know, what, where to find the right balance. And you're finding, I think, candidly with the Biden administration, you know, they're wrestling with it too. They've had a lot of strong rhetoric about democracy, but when you look at the, you know, individual countries that they're dealing with on a bilateral basis, they are not, I mean, they've not really challenged India on the uh, really egregious violations of rights there. Uh, Saudi Arabia, I think it's interesting, Peter, that, I believe this is true, uh, and you might fact check me on this. I don't think the president has had a conversation with MBS. No. And that's interesting. Right. So that's, that's a signal. He did host the Emir of Qatar. Yeah. So I think that's interesting. You know, he did not sanction him uh, the way many human rights groups, including Free House, thought that he should sanction him. But, you know, so it's a mixed picture. Uh, uh, I think one of the things you come up against is that the United States is, is hard to do things alone. You have to have allies to do things with. And uh, uh, I think actually on Ukraine, I'm struck. It does seem to me that Biden has done a fairly reasonable job of trying to marshal the allies to try to deter you know, Putin from invading uh, uh, Ukraine. And even the Wall Street Journal columnist this week gave Biden some credit for that, which was interesting. Well, but just look at the connections across it. So we, the president has not met with MBS, so far as we know. Uh, and he has a get tough policy on Ukraine to include threatening uh, to shut down Nord Stream 2 and impose sanctions on Russia, which will create a crisis in the oil and gas markets. And to mitigate that crisis, he's counting on MBS to open the sluices of Saudi Arabia oil to make up the difference. So that's a long-winded way of saying there is a coherent uh, worldview that's that's very prominent in, in, in the academy, the realist worldview that says, once you get into the hectoring business of Freedom House, you're putting your interests at risk for these kinds of situations where you need MBS to get on side uh, and you have been um, scolding him and making him mad. Well, I would look at it this way. I think you have to look at every country individually, you know, the bilateral relationship, you know, the United States, I don't think, you know, I don't think anyone in the human rights committee would, would say that human rights is the only value that's at stake in these bilateral relations that we recognize even with China, you know, we have to uh, recognize that we have to work with China on things like global economy or on climate change, mm -hmm. but you also can't run away from your values and you have to look for ways to make it clear, uh, you know, where you stand, I think on some of these issues. And I would also say, Peter, that I do think that I think what the realists fail to capture is that in the long run, if the United States is surrounded effectively by a lot of authoritarian countries that don't really share our values, that's a problem for us. It means we're going to have less security because if you just look to me, what Putin, the kind of mischief he's making just in Syria and Ukraine, uh, they're, they're not, he's not, you know, in, he's not, what's the right way of saying it, uh, constrained by any, you know, sense of proportion uh, in those countries. Uh, 
we're going to be losing investment opportunities. I mean, when in the in the 90s, we all thought that Russia was going to be a great investment opportunity for the West, and it's, 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 that's not happening. So I think there's some. I think we. I think it's important for groups like Freedom House and others to really make a strong case that it's in our interest in the long term to be fighting for human rights and democracy, even if in certain cases we sometimes you know, have to make compromises. Is it in their interest? If I could get you five minutes with Orban, could you sell him on Freedom House vision? No, because Orban wants to stay in power and he's spending, the, he's spending, He's spent the last 15, 10 years, you know, trying to tweak the system so that it's very difficult for him to be dislodged from power. So in a sense, your target is less the leaders of the other countries and the pub, more the publics of the other countries. The public and the activists. Mm -hmm. You know, I think that, first of all, I would never say that Freedom House or any other of the United States should be imposing democracy. That's up to the people of individual countries. We can be supportive, we can be in solidarity with them, you know, but, but it's up to people of individual countries to choose their way. But I think, I mean, I think what you're seeing is a lot of self-interest in the part of these people like Putin and Orban and, and Xi Jinping. You know, I thought one of the most Orwellian documents I saw, Peter, was the document that Xi Jinping and Putin released on the eve of the Olympic Games in which they were trying to redefine their systems into a democracy, which is completely farcical. But it does show that the uh, value of the word democracy. Yes, that's an interesting point, that, that they're not saying, hey, we're authoritarian. Right. <laughs> and we're really good at it. And we're really good at it. They say, we're democracies. You just don't understand us. So uh, as you indicated at the beginning, uh, U.S. scores on democracy have declined on your watch. This is coincidence, I hope, right? That Total coincidence. But uh, it's... They, they, they actually declined before I got to Freedom House. Okay. Well, that's that's interesting. So what caused the decline and when, when did it start? What, to what do you attribute it? Or, I mean, it, numerically, there's something that's happening. So what are the numbers that are going down? Well, let me just give you the numbers as we've uh -huh. reported them. So... 11 years ago, uh, the U.S. scored 94 on a scale of 100. And that kind of put us in the category of countries like France, Germany, UK, you know, the kind of our traditional Western allies, NATO allies. So over the last 11 years, the scores have declined to now 83 last year. Mm. And I do think you know, lots of people will say, hey, this is President Trump who caused this. And, uh, you know, we were critical of things that I'm happened. Happy to blame it on Obama. If it's well, but, 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 you know, there, there, we, 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 we've been critical of trends, you know, starting 11 years ago. And I see, you know, President Trump as both a symptom and a so what cause were, of some of the problems. What were some of those trends? What are some of the components where we've lost ground? Uh, well, I would say... We did, a, we did a report earlier in the middle of last year that kind of looked at the last 10 years of what happened in the U.S. And uh, we basically identified three areas where the U.S. has kind of been, I mean, there, there are lots of specific things that happen in given years, so it's hard to kind of summarize every score change. And by the way, sometimes you have an increase in one area and then a decrease in another area. But I think in general, uh, I think the three issues that we have focused on is number one, uh, the influence of special interests on the political system, which is really substantial, uh, especially on sort of a global scale. And by the way, this is something like that, dark money, that kind of thing. Is that what you're talking all about? of that. And, and I think that that is something, by the way, that I think that both Republicans and Democrats and independents are worried about. We actually worked in my first year at Freedom House, we did a poll and we worked with both a Republican pollster and a Democratic pollster. And we worked with the Bush Institute and also with the, with the Biden Center at the University of Pennsylvania 
about American attitudes towards democracy. And one of the key findings was, in general, a widespread concern about the functioning and operations of democracy. Not necessarily the I, people believed in democracy, but they were worried that government wasn't working. This issue of, 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 of influence of special interests was big. And I, I clearly think that that animated some of President uh, Trump's support as well as uh, you know others. Okay, so decline there, you said two others. Uh, the other area would be, second area would be equal justice and sort of the you know, ongoing impacts of, uh, of uh, you know, a legacy of, you know, there's ongoing discrimination in, in, in the system. I, now I would say we've improved, but that's still there. Uh, and then, you know, the third area we talked about is just political polarization. Uh, and I think, you know, for instance, one area in that regard is just the widespread use of partisan gerrymandering, which both parties are guilty of, uh, which has really distorted the idea of that elections you know, should be uh, should be you know contested uh, in a fair way. So, do you get an a favorable audience at home when you're preaching to the the home choir? It's mixed, to be honest, Peter. I think uh, I have found that. There's some people who say we're being too negative about the U.S. And there are other people who say we're not being negative enough, just to be honest. Uh, and and I, I think the way we approach it is like, we don't decide going in, like, here's a U.S. score. You know, it's built by looking at, you know, each of these different indicators, you know, were the elections free and fair? You know, what, you know, uh, was the head of government you know, duly elected. I mean, they're, they're, they're right there on the website and how we score each country can be seen in those areas. And so, and, and, and we don't like make wild changes in these scores. Like if, a, you know, if we downgrade the US in one year to say from a four, which is the highest you can get in a, in a specific head to three, you're not gonna keep downgrading them because on a global scale until they do something to make it go back up to four. So, you you may be not ready to tell us what the score is going to be for the United States. We have to stay tuned for two weeks. We have weeks. to stay tuned. But we're going to have a pup, we're going to have, we're going to we're going to have a webinar about this. So hypothetically, yes. if the U.S. say had a rocky transition between one president and another, yeah. um, and that there was lots of contestation after the election about the validity of the election, would that would hurt our score? Hypothetically. Hypothetically, it would hurt the score if, for instance, there was not a, if there's an interruption in the you know, peaceful transfer of power, it would most definitely hurt the score. But what you don't know, Peter, is that there could be improvements in other areas. Mm -hmm. So you don't know what the total score is because- You every, have to watch. You have to watch. <laughs> <laughs> but it's, it's still concerning. Okay, I'm gonna ask my last question and then I wanna open up to the floor, but- uh, it, this sounds like a mammoth exercise in of analytic and human labor. It, it actually is. And one of the things I'm really proud of, you know, it's, uh, we have a whole research team in New York of about 25 people. We, we have 200 consultants or so around the world. The project essentially costs us a million dollars to produce every year. Um, well, that tees up my question. It, it, yes. You hire Duke uh, students uh, for these kinds of, Things because it was absolutely and well one thing I well, I've been I've been touting this all day is that we have really started a great post graduation fellowship uh, we call it the Freedom in the World Fellows okay and we're actually the applications are being accepted right now if you're graduating in May or June where you come to Freedom House for a year and you work on a specific region of the world and you basically work with the experts in in helping you know analyze the countries and gathering the data that goes into the score. So it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a great project. So that's for graduates, but you also take summer interns. We definitely take summer interns, absolutely. And by the way, we've started paying summer interns. Oh. Which is a uh, something Dangerous, that, slippery slope. Yeah. Well, no, it's the right thing to do because- Probably I, improves your own internal freedom score if you- uh, <laughs> Well, I, 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 I think that it's, it's just a fairer way of, of doing things so that you know, there's some people who can't take an unpaid 
summer intern and they're being priced, you know, potentially priced out of that. So we, we, don't, we don't want financial constraints to, to enter into whether you apply for a Freedom House internship. And so leaving the money aside, you're optimistic enough that this is a uh, growth industry. You're not joining a buggy whip factory that the freedom as a, as a appeal will, has a future for it, for careers, I'm thinking. Well. I expected you to give a more optimistic answer no, well, no, no, than, than not, well. I'm, no, 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 I'm I, trying to I, sell your organization. No, 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 no. What I was going to say is there's so many problematic things happening around the world that I feel like we have more than enough issues work to, to work on uh, over the next certainly 25 years. So whether, 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 I mean, my, my hope is that we turn the map green and that it, we, we make it, we turn ourselves out of a job, but that doesn't seem to be human nature. Fair enough. Okay, Ruthie, I've got you first. to us. Um, given the current state of affairs, I wonder if the U.S. fails to protect and preserve the democratic structures in Ukraine and Taiwan, how do you predict that will enable or empower democratic backslidings in other countries threatened by autocrats? Not sure I follow the question. Can you, can you repeat it again? Sure. If the U.S. fails to protect democracy, like dem democratic yeah. structures in Ukraine and Taiwan, uh, how do you protect? What impact that? will that have? Yes, sir. I see. Well, first of all, going back to the point that I made during the conversation with Peter is, I do think, you know, freedom is up to the people of a. You know, it's up to the people of Taiwan. It's up to the people of Ukraine. It's up to the people of Belarus. You know, we could help them. It, 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 it seems to me that in general, across many presidents, we have. You know, you know, come to the defense of, of, of people who want to be free in, in, in these countries. And, uh, you know, we have, uh, you know, we have treaty uh, obligations uh, in a number of these places. So I think it's important for the U.S. to stand up for freedom. And, and if they don't, will it have a domino effect? I think that's the question. Well, I think you look at history and say, if you, I mean, that's one of the, but that's where the realists, you know, argument may go awry that if you don't, you know, like if, if, if President Biden today was like negotiating with Vladimir Putin and saying, all right, you can like stay in Crimea and, you know, I'll promise you, you know, Ukraine will never be part of NATO if you, if you just pull your forces away, you know, that would like embolden Xi Jinping, you know, on Taiwan the next day. So I, I, that's the way I see it. I, what do you think, Peter? I, th I think you're right, but I think they're more interested in your view than my view. They're tired of my view. Thank you for a fantastic discussion. Um, my question for you has to do with AI technology in China. So we're seeing a lot of Chinese schools that are implementing AI technology to monitor and incentivize, if you will, their students' performance. And I just wonder how technologies like this that kind of border on the line of being productive for education versus surveilling their students, how that might impact freedom scores in the future? It's a great question. The, the honest answer is I don't totally know. What I do know is that China has over the last 20 years or so really honed its use of surveillance and other technologies to uh, to kind of keep their population in line. I thought it was interesting when President Clinton was president, you know, he famously made the comment, hey, China will never, you know, control the internet because it'd be like trying to nail jello to the wall. That's roughly the quote that he that he said. And the truth is that China has been very effectively created a vast censorship network over with 2 million or more sensors, you know, the great Chinese firewall. So I think really one of the challenges of our time and human rights in general going forward is how we are going to make sure that these technologies, you know, like facial recognition, which, you know, can really be helpful in some cases, can also be tools of repression. And to make sure that we deny, you know, as, as democracies, 
as best we can, deny those uh, technologies to authoritarian states. Don't you see, though, a little bit of glimmer of hope in the struggle it appears she is having in maintaining extreme lockdown conditions on COVID, that, that that seems to be cracking and the public is beginning to say enough is enough, uh, which is what you would expect, right? With the freedom is beating in everyone's heart, they want out. Right. I think that's a good point, Peter. And the other thing that I will also say in general is that dictators are not immune to the same forces that cause problems for democracies. So a good example would be corruption. Like I think corruption is Vladimir Putin's, you know, Achilles heel. Uh, you know, Alexander Navalny, you know, catapulted to prominence in Russia by, you know, the use of YouTube to spotlight the corruption of the leadership there. And I think whether you live in an authoritarian setting or whether you live in a democracy, people do not like corruption. And so I think, you know, and, and Xi Jinping's gonna have to continue to ha have economic growth too. So that, you know, he, he will be constrained by the same forces that more openly constrain, you know, American or European politicians. We just don't know about it yet. And she would agree with you. He's cracked down on corruption, although yes. it appears that he's cracked down on corruption by his political opponent. Yes, Yeah. correct. Which is a start, but it's only a start. Okay. Here. Hi, Mr. Bromwich. Thank you so much for being here. Um, earlier, you said that the kind of authoritarianism and democratic backsliding problems were idiosyncratic in each country and how we can't really put a one size fits all label on this. Whereas like, if you're looking at it, kind of all the places where democracy is backsliding, whether it be Hungary, um, in China, Russia, and Belarus, and even in the US, a lot of it seems to be leaders following the similar playbook and doing so by flooding the zone online with disinformation. Um, and it seems like internet is at the center of a lot of these recently backsliding countries. So could that kind of be somewhat of a one size fits all label on why this is happening now? Yeah, let, let me, if I may, make a little bit of a alteration of what I said earlier. I mean, I, I, think, I, think there, I think you do have to analyze each country individually. But I do think that there are trends that cut across these countries. Like one, one issue, for instance, is what we've called at Freedom House and others too, you know, the kind of authoritarian playbook. You know, authoritarians like watch each other and they copy each other, essentially. I think that Vladimir Putin has been, for instance, a leader in some of the things that he's done that have now been copied by other authoritarians, you know, the use of the so-called, you know, foreign agent laws, where basically he cripples civil society by forcing them to label themselves of, you know, as a, as a foreign agent. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, Putin, you know, not surprisingly, in, you know, in his first year or two in office, really moved decisively to kind of bring the kind of independent press in Russia, you know, under his control and to you know, install favored you know, jurists in the judiciary. So he did everything he could to basically limit checks on his power internally. And for those who didn't play ball, like Kordakovsky, he sent them to Siberia. So, uh, and then I think other dictators watch them. Sarah. Uh, thank you so much for coming to speak to us tonight. My question has to do with the scoring of the countries. You mentioned that you look at 24 different indicators. I was wondering sort of how those are weighted and whether it's pretty equal, if there are definitely some that carry more weight and have a greater impact on the score. Uh, they're all roughly equally weighted. Um, they, uh, uh, You know, we, we, we have we have you know we have some discretion if there is a really egregious thing that happens that's sort of outside of the score to to take note of that. So, for instance, like ethnic cleansing, you know, which has by the way been a growing problem in in recent years. But but basically, uh, they're all roughly equal. It, this is a minor uh, political science methods point, but. They, uh, we've learned a lot about building indexes since 1973. 
But if you improve your building of the index, you lose intertemporal uh, comparisons. So do you have yeah, like yeah, yeah, yeah. classic edition and and the improved? No, 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 that, no, that's a good point. We try not to change the methodology too much. We try not to improve is what you're well, saying. We, well, that. it's a good point. <laughs> I see your point. We, it's, it's not a perfect situation. Yeah, it's a challenge. Francis. I was really struck by the contrast that between, you know, right when you were introducing um, your organization, how this long and strong tradition of like physical activism and stuff versus now in, in the 21st century, you see authoritarian seemingly getting an edge in the digital realm. And I'm wondering what a like evolved civil society, grassroots, like digital pro-democracy campaign would look like. Um, and you know, are you confident that maybe you are on the cusp of figuring that out, or will you need, you know, the support of Western democracies in order to confront the big organizations that are fighting against democracy? You know, it's a great question, uh, and there has been a lot of, you know, looking at this issue of like what actually works in promoting democracy. Uh, one thing, by the way, that seems to work is that. Is, is peaceful protests and peaceful resistance, not violent resistance. Uh, you know, a number of political scientists have, you know, done, you know, looked at successful, you know, campaigns for freedom and have found that you've had more success essentially when you avoid violence. You know, like in the Syrian revolution, when it turned violent, that would have been, that under this theory would have been, would have been a boon to the, uh, to the Assad regime. Um, I think, uh, there's training to be done that, uh, you know, and learning from each other about, about what works and, 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 what, and what doesn't work. Uh, but I think you have to respect, again, what's happening inside each of these countries. And uh, I'm, I'm struck by Sudan. You know, I, I follow Sudan. You, know, you and I talked a lot about Sudan during the uh, Bush administration. That was an issue that President Bush cared a lot about. And there was a genocide in Darfur, which was labeled as such by the US government. And you essentially had a, a 30 year military regime that honestly I thought was never gonna change. But there were, and, and there really wasn't much attention I think from kind of the US human rights and democracy community to what was happening. But there, was, there were professionals in Sudan, doctors, lawyers, nurses, et cetera, who on their own were getting sick of the situation and led a, essentially a, a revolution which toppled Bashir. And now sadly, the, uh, you know, that's been, you know, the generals are now back in charge. But I do think that to me, that says sometimes you can't always you know, predict where this is gonna happen and sometimes you're surprised. Right, you also get the, that if, they try democracy, try democracy, it doesn't work, then they'll try maybe some other, they'll be drawn to some other, you know, a communist or some other ideology that would rescue them from this particular uh, autocrat. Uh, Jonathan. Uh, thank you so much for joining us. And now that you've said that predictions are so hard, I'd actually like to ask for your prediction on a thing or two. Um, seeing as- Make a prediction, but if you want. <laughs> awesome. Seeing that our conversation on India, China, and Russia, especially focused on the individual leaders of Modi, Putin, and Xi Jinping, do you expect there to be a significant change when these leaders are replaced, or would you identify their backsliding more in line with, say, the BJP, CCP, and United Russia? You know, that's a great question. And again, just to be honest, I don't know the countries well enough to know the answer to that. I think what I do feel, however, and you talk to China experts, you know, there are a lot of very good China experts who feel that, that there's kind of a feat of play with, you know, Xi Jinping and that there is a lot of discontent that's, 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 uh, that's not really reflected in, in a lot of the writing. And certainly like my colleagues who study China think that there's actually in small ways more protest that's happening around China over things like land rights or property rights than, than people are know. So I think in a closed society, you don't quite know what's happened, but I think fully in 10 years, we could be having liberalization in China again. I just, I mean, very, you know, not a lot of people predicted the fall of the Berlin Wall when that happened up until even the CIA, right? Up until the, you know, a year or two 
They, they never predicted it. So I, I think that sometimes in closed societies, uh, I, I'm cautious about making predictions that this is going to perpetuate in perpetuity. In, in a sense, you have to believe because that's the foundation principle of Freedom House. Yes. That, right. You're on the right side of history is what I'm saying. Yeah. Thank you much. Thank you so much for being here. I think we all really appreciate your time. My, my question is about how you formulate the indexes with regards to different cultural understandings and perceptions of freedom. Because um, obviously like a, an American perspective of freedom is different than what, um, let's say a Chinese perspective, even if China isn't free right now, a different perception of what freedom is in a Chinese sense or an Israeli sense or, or a German sense. <clears throat> One quick example that I thought of is the idea of freedom of speech. Um, so I'd say obviously the US has freedom of speech. So does, for example, let's say Germany and so does Israel. Um, but I know I'm half Israeli and I know in Germany and Israel, uh, for freedom of speech concerns, you're not allowed, for example, let's say Holocaust depictions, you're not allowed to have swastikas. stickers, um, you're not allowed to talk about the Holocaust unless it's a, in a sanctioned sphere. Whereas the US, they have different perceptions of freedom of speech and you can be more outspoken with different matters. So how does that kind of just both having this idea for no speech, but different cultural understandings impact your index? Well, our indicators are derived from the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, you know, the rights that were, I mean, obviously there are more than, there were not 24 freedoms there, but, you know, the idea that freedom of speech, freedom of religion, that the idea that these are Western constructs, you know, is, is not, in my view, true. And there's a really great book that I would highly recommend about by, by maybe a former colleague of yours, Marianne Glendon from Harvard Law School, who looked at the, I read that book a few years ago and it's quite struck because, you know, that, that process of drawing up the Universal Declaration took into account you know, some of the different cultural situations around the world, but essentially these are foundational, these are foundational uh, freedoms that reside in individuals and are not like conferred by governments. Uh, and so I think that our point of view would be, you know, you have to understand the cultural context, but that these are fundamental freedoms, you know, the, 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 the freedom to have religion or worship of God. Freedom of religion. <laughs> freedom of religion. Not freedom you don't have a funny conversation about that today, but, 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 but the, uh, but the, uh, I mean, I think these are foundational. So and you don't grade on the curve. There's no, we don't, we don't grade on the curve. Sure, thank you so much for being here. Um, my question is more on the advocacy side. I feel like we've talked a lot about the data gathering process. And I know that you mentioned that you work with human rights organizations across the globe. I wondered how you went about identifying those partners and vetting them for good relationships in the future. It's a great question. Uh, one of my goals at Freedom House is to kind of build a stronger advocacy team. We're, 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 we're kind of small, but we're, we're growing. Uh, you have to, you know, you, you, you have to vet them. You have to look at them carefully. Uh, I think the issue is really like what issues you're going to focus on because uh, there's no shortage of problems in the world. Uh, but, you know, and, and, and we're a relatively small organization as these things go. And so we, so, so I, I, uh, I would say you know, a lot of our focus in recent years has been around the use of uh, targeted sanctions to target individual human rights abusers. So you might have heard of the Magnitsky sanctions that were uh, that were instituted at the end of the Obama administration and were used by Trump and Biden to go after individual human rights abusers. And I think that's a potential game changer in this area because Traditionally, sanctions have been seen as not that effective because of kind of a blunt instrument to go after a whole country. In this case, you're really targeting people who are responsible for the, for the, uh, for the human rights violations and people who care about, for instance, parking their money in the West or sending their kids to a uh, US or UK university. I, I thought I heard her ask a different, slightly different question, which is how do you have confidence in the groups that you have ah. picked to work with? How do you vet them? How do you know you're not hiring Putin's thugs? 
right? Is that closer to you? I didn't quite say it as well, but <laughs> yeah. yes. Okay, okay. I'm, I'm sorry. I'm, I, I'm sorry. I, I misunderstood. Um, we, you know, we spend a lot of time making sure that the groups we work with, uh, in individual. I mean, first of all, you know, there are a lot of groups in, in America that uh, that we work with uh, in in coalition. And by the way, one can be critical. I'm sure. No one agrees with everything Freedom House does. You know, we don't agree with everything Human Rights Watch does, but we agree with them on a lot, and we work with them on on issues where where where. Our, I mean, our, our our focus is the issue, you know, not right. And if we can have alliances on issues, that's what we're that's what we're looking to do. And I have a great deal of respect for that organization. Um, uh, but 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 I think the harder problem is overseas, yes. where we are working you know, on the ground in a number of countries. Sometimes we don't work openly because our presence there would actually endanger the people we're trying to help. So that's an issue. Uh, and so we just have to be very careful. And, in, 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 you know, in certain countries in the world, we've had a long standing presence and we know who the people that are doing good work and, we, and we're very careful about it. Uh, but but that's, it's, a, it's, 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 it's a constant concern. I mean, the other thing that I concern about just you're making me think about this is, you know, the bad guys like Russia, you know, they're they're out to embarrass us too. They're working so the issue hard. They're working the issue too, and they're and they're looking, you know, sometimes to, you know, have people who are fake journalists approach you and try to fool you into, you know, being unguarded. So you have to really be careful. Yes, I was going to ask, um, at the very beginning, I think you mentioned briefly just how COVID has really reflected, um, in many cases, a decline of freedom. And I guess I wanted to ask you a little further, even in some country cases um, like Australia and Austria and, um, yeah, a variety of cases where I think people have become, well, people have very diverse perspectives, that's for sure, as to even what freedom reflects in these times of crisis, of um, yeah, broader issues in society. And I guess, how would you, what would your reflection on that be? Um, and how do, we, how do we address the issue of freedom in times of crisis when governments tend to perhaps overstep or there's kind of this ratchet effect? And then how do we look at that going forward in terms of assessments of freedom in the long term? It's a great question. I think that historically, you've seen the greatest threats to freedom happening in wartime or time of crises, right? Where people, you know, that, you know, during, you know, after 9-11, there was, you know, you know, tremendous, you know, incursion on, on rights in certain areas in terms of surveillance, in terms of hoovering up information. So I think, honestly, that's why there are groups like Freedom House or the ACLU or others to remind people that, you know, these are important rights. Uh, and that, you know, what I really worry about is that and this, ha this, and this is the issue with COVID. Now my, my appearances, my talks with Duke students are kind of running together. I forgot whether it's this group or the previous group I talked to, but, you know, the, the danger is that, you know, necessary restrictions to, to curb certain immediate things are then kind of institutionalized. And that's a real problem. Okay, I think we have time for our last two questions. Let's collect both of them and you answer both as you can here and then Sam. Okay. Thank you again so much for being here. This has been a really interesting and informative talk. Um, I wanted to ask about the homogeneity of the populations in the countries that you're looking at. Um, I know you've said that Scandinavia has um, always been one of the very high rankings on the Freedom House thing. How do you believe that the homogeneity of the population affects it? Um, the ranking and how will it affect in the future? Great question, Sam. Yeah, um, thank you so much again. I'm afraid this goes in a slightly different direction, but I was wondering about sort of your point about the internet um, being used as a tool of oppression by certain states. And I was wondering how that sort of differs from social media enabled revolutions and how um, it could sort of act as a double-edged sword for both um, oppressing populations, but also helping them mobilize. Okay, you got them? I think so. <laughs> I think it's a great question. And I do have wondered to myself and talked with some of my colleagues, 
that I think the more homogeneous societies have an easier time of it, I think. You know, countries like the United States or India, or, or many actually other countries, you know, all around the world that have more diverse populations, you know, managing, you know, ethnic, racial, other differences, maintaining pluralism, you know, that's to me one of the great beauties of the United States that, you know, you know we, one can be very critical about what's happening here in certain areas, but, you know, we, we are a very diverse country and we're, you know, it's, it's harder to manage democracy in a, in, a, in, a, in a country that's diverse than in a country that is more homogeneous. So I think, you know, as Peter, to borrow your previous phrase, you know, we try to call it like we see it, there's no grading on the curve, but I do think in some ways the U.S. has a, has a big challenge, bigger challenge there than, you know, maybe some other countries. And technology helping or hurting or both? Both. <laughs> I mean, right now we're in a right now we're in a wave where technology really seems to be a problem from the point of view of human rights. I mean, there's no way around it, and I think there's a lot of attention to that issue uh, that's being paid. And I think it's 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 a big agenda item for the human rights community for the next thirty years, right? That 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 some of these technologies are really helpful, but they also have a bad side to it. And we just have to make sure that we limit the capacity for bad that's coming from it. Well, we are glad that you are uh, on this case, that you are, are working the issue. We wish you success. We hope you will hire lots of Duke students to help you uh, in this effort. And uh, just remains for us to thank you for coming and enlightening us on this. Thank you, Peter.